The following is a Joel Mahalik production. <clears throat> Let me explain something to you. Whenever you come in here and interrupt me, you're breaking my concentration. You're distracting me. And it will then take me time to get back to where I was. Understand? And now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you Fibber McGee and Molly in Backseat Driver, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Looks like old home week on suspense tonight. Old home week, Cap? Well, I wouldn't say that. Not with millions of Autolite resistor spark plugs finding new homes in every make of car in America. Well, I know, Harlow. I, I meant old home week because... Why, Hap, there just isn't going to be any old or new home for more and more narrow gap spark plugs because they're being replaced in their old homes by wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. With Autolite resistor spark plugs, your car, my car, Fibber's car, everybody's car... Idle smoother, gives better performance with lean gas mixtures, saves gas dollars, and cuts down spark plug interference with radio and television reception. There's one way for every car to be spark plugged right, with Autolite resistor spark plugs. Only Autolite offers car and truck owners everywhere the sensational advantages of the resistor type spark plug. And now, Autolite presents Fibber McGee and Molly in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It can't happen to you. You read about stuff like that in the papers. Girls murdered and mutilated, drunks left dying in the gutter for the handful of change they had in their pockets, lonesome old men tortured because some hoodlum gets the idea they're misers with a pot of gold hidden under the floorboards of the shack. Sure, you know it's real, but it can't happen to you. Oh, you get your fair share of trouble. I've been a professional man here in Los Angeles for 30 years. I've met up with bums and grifters and petty sharpers. They're around in any business. But the viciousness, the real deep-down dirt, that's for somebody else. You do your work and go home to your family. And for a real bang-up evening to break the monotony, you take your wife out to a movie. That's what I did that Saturday night. We'd driven all the way in from the San Fernando Valley to Beverly Hills for a picture Ellie especially wanted to see. Wasn't that a good movie, Joe? Uh Uh-huh. Just the kind I like. Songs and dancing and girls in pretty clothes. Ah, I get so tired of cops and robbers. (laughs) What's wrong with cops and robbers? Oh, you know what I mean. Murder movies. Honestly, all the policemen stupid and all the crooks sneering out of the corners of their mouths. Yeah, the stuff those Hollywood boys dream up. You'd think the streets were knee-deep in blood and you couldn't hear yourself think for machine guns. Yeah. Well, here we are, honey. You get in first. Okay. All right, Ellie? Well, now, just a second. All right, Joe. Don't forget the gas. I got plenty to take us out to the valley. I'll fill up at Bill's. Be da da. De- <laughs> you remember how that song goes, Joe? What song? In the picture, you know, two on the moon, the one the boy sang to the girl. Oh, that one. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, heck, I don't know. Oh well, we'll be hearing it again on the radio. How about turning it on? The radio? Yeah. Sure. Set her around 1100. We ought to get some news in a few minutes. I'd like to hear whether they caught that fellow. That awful mass murderer? Uh Uh-huh. They spotted him in L.A. this afternoon, but he got away. I know. You told us at supper. It makes you shiver. Don't worry. He won't get away with it. (laughs) 
We left the lights of Beverly Hills behind and turned into Coldwater Canyon. It's as quick a way as any to get us across the Hollywood Hills to the valley. It's dark in the canyon, quiet, with mighty little traffic at night. I cut my lights up full and we swept up the side of the ridge. The news program came on, but I didn't pay much attention. The fellow was talking about brush fires. They'd already put out one near my place, though they were still patrolling it. We were over the ridge and sliding down to the valley before the program got to the part I wanted to hear. There it is. Pick it up higher, Ellie. And now the latest news on the New Hampshire murderer. Two weeks ago, Lewis Matrick wiped out an entire family in Greenlee, New Hampshire. Today, he was spotted 3,000 miles from the scene of his crime. At 5.30 this afternoon, a patrolman saw and definitely identified Matrick in downtown Los Angeles. He is here. However, by darting through heavy traffic at the risk of his life, the killer was again able to make his escape. According to neighbors of the slaughtered family, Matrick first appeared in Greenlee about a year ago. From fingerprints in the Nolan home, Lewis Matrick has been identified as Lloyd Matthews, ex-convict. He is wanted for questioning in the robbery and murder of a New York storekeeper a year ago. Oh, my. A crime that netted the killer less than $20. Can you imagine? Matrick, or Matthews, is 32 years old, height 5 feet 9 inches, weight... 155 pounds. He has blue eyes, light brown hair, nose slanted to the left. When seen this afternoon, he was wearing a blue suit and a gray pork pie hat. He... Awful. Awful. Not pretty, no. And he's somewhere around L.A. this minute. Joe? Hmm? You think it's right us leaving Annie and Bud all alone while we... Now, Ellen. Annie's grown up, and Bud's a smart youngster, if I do say so myself. You can't wrap kids in cotton wool. I know. <laughs> oh, I'm silly, I guess. Neighbors close all around. All they'd have to do is yell. But what would make a young man do a dreadful thing like that? Could be a lot of things. Maybe he's got a screw loose. Maybe he went nuts over a girl. Maybe he gets a kick out of killing like you some of... You know all the answers, don't you? Oh, Joe! Hey, what the... Keep going. Go on, keep going. I got a gun here and I'll use it. Tell him you. Ellie... Against the back of my neck. I can feel it. Cold. Well, are you going to move? Okay. Okay, brother. Oh. You're the boss. You said it. I'm boss. And remember it. Otherwise, I'll blow a hole through your wife's head. <laughs> I've had experience in these things. <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Fibber McGee and Molly in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Uh, Harlow, I've got to run. My wife Mary just called up and said someone stole our Autolite resistor spark plugs right out of the engine of our car. Gosh, Hap, I didn't know they were that precious. Skip along. Uh, so long. Oh, that Mary. What a girl. She's wonderful. I said to Hap the other day, she's got everything an auto light resistor spark plug's got. Hap comes right back and says to me, has she got a 10,000 ohm resistor? Does she save me gas and money, Harlow? And then right away he says, tell me this, does Mary improve radio and television reception? Well, by Cornelius, I couldn't stand it any longer. What's Mary got to do with that, I cried. Nothing, shouts the triumphant Hap. Right, I shout back, but by Cornelius, those sleek, slim, trim, smart, swift, starting auto light resistor spark plugs have. Why, when it comes to plugs, even mine, there's no plug as good as a set of auto light resistor spark plugs. And those wonderful wonders are made by the auto light company, the marvelous makers of spark plugs, batteries, complete ignition systems, and over 400 automotive, aviation, and marine parts. And now, auto light brings back to our Hollywood soundstage. Fibber McGee and Molly in Backseat Driver, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I drove that car like we were skirting the rim of the Grand Canyon with nothing between us on the bottom but a mile of country air. This was it, the thing that happens to other people, to the ones that end up on slabs in the morgue. But not to me, not to Ellie. The first car we'd seen since we left traffic swooped down behind us. It passed, but not before the headlights caught our passenger clean in my rearview mirror. He was hunched forward, sitting on the edge of the back seat so he could keep the gun rammed into the nap of Ellie's neck. 
He had light brown hair, pale eyes, and a nose that slanted. His mouth twitched, jittery. As the car went by, his eyes caught mine in the mirror and flickered. Keep your eyes on the road. Sure, sure. Lose your hat? Bright boy. Like I said, you know all the answers. No, I didn't lose it. I stuffed it down a drain. Still wearing the blue suit, though. I figured it changed pretty quick now. Think yours will fit me? You can have the suit and the card. Just let it... Ellen. Joe, it's Matrick. (laughs) The missus is bright, too. He crawled in here while we were in the movie. Joe, you should have had the car door fixed. You know better. Honey, I meant to. I was going to tend to that tomorrow. Shut up. Let's see if you can both be bright enough to keep your trap shut. Turn left on Ventura. Take the slow lane. And don't try playing no tricks. I've been in this burg before. Okay by me. That's real white of you. Straight out to open country, Mac. Then I'll take the missus up on that offer of the suit and car. What happens to us? Why, you just walk home. What else? Play it safe, and you ain't got a thing to worry about. That was a laugh, that was. Nothing to worry about. That'd kill you. Once we got out into open country, we'd have a chance of walking away from the car. All a murderer can hope for is time. He doesn't leave witnesses around to get the law on his tail one second sooner than necessary. All I could do was stall and pray and make what feeble gestures I could at Lady Luck. The thing that came into my mind was so risky it brought my hair up on end. But there was a chance, provided that trigger finger didn't start jerking. In the bright lights of the boulevard, I didn't think he'd notice. But a traffic officer would. I turned into Ventura and took the far lane, obedient as a whip pup. Must have made two or three miles before I heard what I was hoping for. What's that? Huh? Oh, the siren? Why, an ambulance, I guess. We hear a lot of that them That ain't here. no ambulance. It's a motorcycle cop. Joe, it's young Mike Kennedy. He patrols this stretch. What are you up to? What are you trying to pull? Nothing. The kid's a friend of us. Think you can get me easier? Well, I warned you. I ain't going alone. You ask for it. Listen, listen, will you? The kid lives near us, practically grew up under our feet. All he wants is to pass the time of day or maybe send a message to our Annie. Yeah? Yeah. You start popping now and we'll all be dead. Keep your shirt on and I'll get rid of him. Okay. But it better be good. I pulled to the curb and Mike came up alongside. He sat balancing the bike between his knees, and the grin on his face was a mile wide. It had worked. At least we were still alive, and Mike wasn't two feet away. But where did we go from here? I had to think, but my brain was wet wool. My tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. Well, what do you know, if it isn't Uncle Joe? Something (laughs) funny, kid? After all the times you've read us the riot act about observing the letter of the law. Oh, brother, wait till I tell Annie. Mike Kennedy, what's the matter with you? I didn't notice anything wrong. Hi, Aunt Ellie. Uh, Nothing much the matter. Just Uncle Joe here proceeding sedately out the boulevard with his headlights up full. Headlights? By golly, that's right. I must have forgotten it, didn't I? You oughtn't to forget those things, Joe. Someday a big bad cop might come along and haul you off to the state. Hey, is that Annie back there? No, no, it, it isn't. It's, uh, it's our new neighbor, Mike, uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson. Oh, that right? Uh, glad to meet you, sir. Hello? I didn't know there were any vacancies out our way. Well, there weren't until recently. Uh, Mr. Anderson has taken over the, the Charles place. The Charles place? Are you kidding? No. Nope. Looks like things got too much for old man Charles at last. He's clearing out for good. Uh, kind of sudden, wasn't it? I guess so. Well, that's too bad. Uh, For old man Charles, I mean. Mighty nice for Mr. Anderson, though. Good places are hard to find these days. Uh, All right, Uncle Joe. I'll let you off this time. Give my love to Annie. Mike! Watch it! Yes, sir? Uh, nothing. Just come see us soon, boy. Always glad to have you. Thanks. I'll be around my next night off. I got a date with Annie. So long. That was that. Mike turned his bike and headed back down the boulevard. The chance had come and gone. But it felt to me like half my mind went off with the boy yelling at him. Must have been half a minute before I could pull myself together and ease back into traffic. Nobody said anything. I didn't dare to, and neither did Ellie. I couldn't see her, but I could feel her holding herself stiff as a ramrod, scared even to turn her head. 
When two people have lived together as long as we have, each one knows what the other one is thinking. I went back to driving and praying. That and cutting my eyes up to the mirror, just in case there might be a white motorcycle eye following us. There wasn't, of course. Back in the back, I knew he was watching, too. Those flickering eyes darting like lightning between us and the rear window. He was too busy checking to talk. Not that that helped much. Rage and fear were pouring out of him so thick you could have grabbed a hunk of the atmosphere in your hand. It was queer to drive along like that on a crowded highway. Traffic streaming both ways. Lights from drugstores and cocktail joints and eating houses blazing to the sky. And to know if I lifted a finger for help, I'd sign our death warrants. It had to be luck. All luck. There was still a chance I'd get it. The way I figured it, we'd started out with just about enough gas to get us back to Bill's station. When we hit that, the meter ought to show empty. The gas gauge was hidden from me by the rim of the steering wheel, but I was pretty sure I was right. I waited until I saw the red and green lights above Bill's pumps a block and a half away. And very slow and easy, I slumped over for a peek at the gauge. I leaned just too far. Shut up! Sure. What now? What were you looking at? I was just easing the crick out of my neck. Yes, you was. You was looking at the dash. You... Oh, so that's it. Fresh out of gas. Look, I just remembered... Don't give me that. You knew it all along. From now on, you keep your hands on the wheel, Mac, but leave me do the driving. Turn into that filling station. Get high test gas and fill her up. Hi, Joe. Hi, Bill. Evening, Hello, Ellie. Bill. Oh, evening, sir. Uh, up at the top? Yeah, Ethel. Ethel it is. Here you've been to the pictures, eh? Uh-huh. You people know everybody in the whole valley. We've lived here 30 years. From back when the, this was just farmland, of course we know lots of people. I don't like it. Get the gas and get out. Say, uh, I was up to Miranda's for supper. That right? Oh, boy, her chili gets better every time. Don't see how it can, but it does. Uh, she's saving some for you. Said you'd be around after the show. Oh, my, I saw Miranda this afternoon and told her we'd be by for sure, Joe. Uh, that'll be three fifty on the nose. Three and fifty. Mm. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, shame to you. What's all that about? Nothing much. Come on, come on. I got to ask you everything twice. Miranda runs a drive-in up the road a ways. On show nights, we usually drop in for a carton of chili to take home. I just hope she won't call home when we don't show up and get Annie all worried. Wait a minute. Drive-in, you said? Yeah. And this Miranda could start checking on you? I didn't mean it like that. It's she just... She could call your Annie, and between the two of them, they'd have the cops on the lookout for you before midnight. You're crazy. Like a fox. I ain't kept ahead of the buttons all this time by taking chances. We'll just pick up that chili, Mac. You want to go to Miranda's? Why not? Leave Annie get a beauty sleep. I can cover a lot of ground before tomorrow morning. I ain't eaten so good lately, I could use the food too. And with you and the missus to front for me? <clears throat> What's to worry about? He was right about that. I went back to driving and praying... Miranda's place is one of those goldfish bowls, mostly glass with light pouring out across the space mark for outside service. She saw us pulling up, grabbed a quart carton off the back shelf and hustled to the door. Here you are, Ellie. I was just saying to Betsy, better fix up that chili, Betsy. It's about time Ellie and Joe was showing up, figuring the distance from Beverly Hills. Thank you, Miranda. Who's that in the back seat? I don't seem to recollect your face, young man. Though anybody will tell you, I never forget a face. Well, uh, this is Mr. Anderson, Miranda. He just came out here from the from the east. Oh, is that a fact? Say, Joe, you planning to go straight up Ventura home? Sure, why? Oh, don't you do it. Go the back way, even if it does take longer. Of course, the brush fire between here and your place is out, but there are still 50, 60 men patrolling it. What's that? Oh, but that ain't nothing to what's going on further out the valley. That new fire's clean out of control. Licking up hundreds of acres. Well, they've been sending truckloads of firefighters past here all evening. And the road's blocked for miles, the road's they blocked. tell me. For miles, they tell me. And all them poor ranchers losing their homes. Being from the east, you wouldn't understand. But brush fires is awful things once they get out. Thanks. Start moving. We take the back way to your house. To our house? What say? 
Oh, you staying with Ellie and Joe? Uh, yeah, until the roads... Uh, until I can get into my own place. What are we waiting for? Night, Miranda. Well, goodbye. <laughs> uh, be sure you come see me, Mr. Anderson. I'll be looking for you. So there it was. We weren't going to the country. We weren't going to be left to rot at the foot of a cliff or buried deep in brush. No. We were going home. Home to the kids. And taking a murderer with us. I still couldn't see Ellie, but I could feel her tensing up, tight as a pulled drawstring. Mr. Matrick, you... You didn't mean what you said, did you, about uh, coming home with us? You know a better place I can hide out till the road's open? But it wouldn't be safe. We've got neighbors close all around. If somebody sees you... Nobody will see me. Nobody better. Joe, uh, couldn't we get around the fire? Yeah, that'd be better. We could try. There are other roads through the valley. Listen, Matrick, we'll nose around and find a way through somehow. Cut it out. You heard the old pity. Hundreds of acres burning. Firefighters, cops. Get off the highway. We're going home. No, no, I won't have it. Joe, you stop the car right here. Shut up. You heard me, Joe. I won't have him in my house, not with Annie and Bob. I said shut up. For Lord's sake, Ellie. It doesn't matter about us, but the kids, I won't let him... One word out of you. No, stop. Ellen, hush. Oh, Joe. Don't say another thing. I'm sorry, honey. Matrick's the boss. We got to do like he says. That's telling her. Sure, go like I say and everything will be rosy. You got no call to worry about the kids. I like kids. As long as nobody gives me the brush off. We'll, we'll wake them up as soon as we get home. And you and this Annie can fix up a chilly supper for us. We'll have us a picnic. And then, as soon as the fire's out, we'll all take a trip to the country. <laughs> Another picnic, huh? <laughs> you keep going As long as you're breathing, you keep going Even when it looks like there's no way out You hang on by your toenails We poked up and down those black valley streets That twist and turn And sometimes wind up in dead ends Ellie stopped crying after a while She slumped down with her head rolling on the seat back Limp as a rag doll with the stuffing leaked out. It took a long time, but it had to come to an end. I saw the bulk of the house looming up. There was light sneaking around the edges of the blinds up in Annie's room. She wasn't asleep after all. She'd be sitting up in bed, maybe plastering red stuff on her fingers and dreaming about the date with Mike. Bud's room was dark. He'd be wrapped in covers like in a cocoon and dreaming. Whatever boys dream, I couldn't remember. I pulled up to the concrete walk I'd poured with my own hands before there was any Annie or Bud. And I cut the lights. In a second or two, my eyes got used to the dark. I could make out the high hedge Jelly planted around the place and the roof rising up beyond it. Out, missus. Face the house. Now you, Mac, slide out the same side. Stand beside her. funny business. I'm right behind you. Look out, Joe! Why down? Ah! I'll kill you! Ah! Hold them, boys! Uh, it's okay, Mike. Got him. You all right, Uncle Joe? And Ellie? Ellie. Mm -hmm. Ellie, honey. You all right? All right, indeed. Smack flat on my face on a concrete walk and you falling on me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with her. <laughs> That's my girl. Oh, well, don't you stand there. Help me up. Here you are. <sighs> oh, I've got to get in the house before the kids come busting out here. I won't have them mixed up in this. Well, how's he doing, boys? Got him through the gun hand on the right shoulder. See? <laughs> a lucky shot, copper. If you weren't lucky, you'd all be cold meat now. Maybe. Matrick, isn't it, Uncle Joe? That's him. Miranda described him to you, eh? The old girl didn't miss a trick. <laughs> she even knew you were taking the back way home. You left a clear trail, Uncle Joe. Slick work. 
I had to get him out of the car before the fireworks started. Ellie didn't stand a chance. She helped, though. Ellie catches on quick. How bad? A mean guy like Matrick. Make him think you don't want to do something, and he'll break his neck doing it. I let on I was trying to run out of gas. That got us to Bill's. Then we both made out there was no sense going to Miranda's, so we got bullied into going to Miranda's. It was a thousand to one she'd run off at the mouth about the brush fires and scare him into hiding out. After that, all Ellie had to do was turn on the hysterics. He was dead set on coming here. <laughs> Bright boy, like I said. Bright enough. You did all right, too, Mike. I was watching the rearview mirror all the time you were tailing us. But you never showed. You knew I was there, though. When one officer starts double-talking another officer, he wants to know why. <laughs> officer, double-talk. You never said a thing to him except that I'd bought some place out here. Yeah, the Charles place. Poor old man Charles. <laughs> In a tough spot and moving out for good. Well, what's wrong with that? Matrick, didn't anybody ever tell you it wasn't smart to take up with strangers? Maybe I'd better introduce myself. The name's Charles. Joe Charles. Detective. Homicide. Tonight I was off duty and was just taking my wife to a movie. Thank you, Fibber McGee and Molly, for a splendid performance. Why, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, bud. We're not used to doing a show with a gun stuck in our backs. No. <laughs> We're used to doing them with Jack Benny breathing down our necks. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> but that guy over there, he, he looks familiar. Why, dearie, that's Mr. Wilcox. Old Waxy himself, the guy that sells Johnson's Wax on our Tuesday show? And not Waxy on Thursdays, dearie. Sparky. Sparky, eh? <laughs> Well, what do you know? Hey, Junior! Hello, Fibber. Hello, Molly. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Say, you two were terrific tonight. Uh, tell me, did you drive over from Wistful Vista? Uh-oh. Molly, I'm afraid to answer that. Because if you did, I hope your car had Autolite resistor spark plugs. <laughs> see what I mean? And listen, <laughs> pal, if I were you, I'd stop and see an Autolite serviceman on the way home. That old bull Listen, of yours... Waxy, I mean, uh, Sparky, you don't have to tell me where to stop. I stopped on the way over. Why, those masterful miracles of manufacturing magnificent... Oh, now, McGee. McGee, that's Mr. Wilcox's story. Let him tell it. Well, what Fibber means is that Autolite parts and orig are original factory parts. Autolite parts and service and your car go together like McGee and Molly, Happ and Harlow, Amos and Andy. So when you replace worn-out parts, visit your Autolite service station or the dealer who sells your make of car and ask for original factory parts and service. Leading cars use them all... Autolite makes them all. Be right. Get Autolite parts and service. Uh, just a minute, Fibber and Molly. Don't go away. Oh, that's right. You want us to say that word? If you please. Oh, yes. Well, go ahead, McGee. No, you say it, Molly. Well, why don't we both say it, then? Okay. Well, I know you're going to want to hear radio's outstanding theater of thrills next week. Because Charles Lawton is going to be on the program. Yes, and in a famous story by John Collier called Demortius. And it's another gripping study in... Suspense. <laughs> Tonight's suspense play was by Sally Thorson, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as James Mason, Jane Wyman, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Charles Lawton in Demortius. You'll find Autolite service stations listed in your classified telephone directory under Automotive Electrical Equipment. You're right with Autolite... This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, during the next 30 minutes you will hear Bing Crosby, Frank Lovejoy, Agnes Moorhead, and Walter Houston as WNBC brings you transcribed a special Memorial Day edition of Anthology.
This is Fleetwood. Every Sunday at 3, WNBC, in conjunction with the Poetry Center of the YW and YMHA, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, brings you Anthology, a selection of readings of poets past and present, and the music to accompany their poetry. This afternoon, as a tribute to Memorial Day, we're to hear two of America's best-known and best-loved patriotic poems, and an equally well-known American story in verse form, read by Bing Crosby. On this Memorial Day of 1954, we have poetry spanning our nation's history from the earliest times to the present day, from verses and dedication to our earliest settlers, to a story and verse which can very well serve as a symbol of that precious freedom for which so many American men and women have fought and died down through the long centuries. We begin with a poem of the birth of our country. Here is the distinguished American actress, Miss Agnes Moorhead, in a dramatic reading of The Landing of the Pilgrim Fathers. The breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast. And the woods against a stormy sky their giant branches tossed. And the heavy night hung dark the hills and waters o'er. When a band of exiles moored their bark on a wild New England shore. Not as the conqueror comes, they the true-hearted came. Not with the roll of stirring drums and the trumpets that sing of fame. Not as the flying come, in silence and in fear. They shook the depths of the desert's gloom with their hymns of lofty cheer. Amidst the storm they sang, and the stars heard, and the sea, and the sounding aisles of the dim woods rang to the anthem of the free. The ocean eagle soared from his nest by the white waves foam. And the rocking pines of the forest roared. This was their welcome home. There were men with hoary hair amidst that pilgrim band. Why had they come to wither there, away from their childhood's land? There was woman's fearless eye lit by her deep love's truth. There was manhood's brow serenely high and the fiery heart of youth. What sought they thus afar? Bright jewels of the mine? The wealth of sea? The spoils of war? They sought a faith pure shrine. I call it holy ground, the soil where first they trod. They left unstained what there they found. Freedom to worship God. In the 1700s, we fought and won our liberty. And then, within another century, America was to go to war not once but twice again. And to our great shame, won a war between the states in which citizen fought citizen. In the North, in the South, divided loyalties, divided homes, names like Harper's Ferry, Shiloh, Bull Run, and in the White House, a tall, gaunt, unhappy man named Abraham Lincoln. The late Walter Houston brings us a poem of the Civil War, a poem of intense sadness written by Walt Whitman upon the assassination of President Lincoln. The special musical accompaniment was written by Victor Young. Walter Houston reads, O Captain... My captain. Oh, captain, my 
my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But oh, heart, heart, heart. Oh, the bleeding drops of red Where on the deck my captain lies Fallen, cold, and dead Oh, captain, my captain Rise up and hear the bells Rise up, for you the flag is flung For you the bugle trills For you bouquets and ribbon wreaths For you the shores are crowding for you they call, the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Dear Captain, dear Father, the arm beneath your head, is it some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead? Captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exalt all shores. And ring all bells. But I with mournful tread walk the deck my captain lies, fallen cold in bed. portion of this special Memorial Day program, we're to listen to The Man Without a Country, a poetic narrative by Gene Holloway, based on Edward Everett Hale's immortal story, and narrated by Bing Crosby, with Frank Lovejoy as Philip Nolan. Many of us have heard this story before. It's been read to us by grammar school teachers, or declaimed, perhaps, by stammering fellow students, in classrooms distracted by spring whispering at an open window or by an autumn kaleidoscope of whirling leaves. We heard it as a text or a lesson. We learned it long before we could conceive of what it would be like to be banished forever from the land of our birth. Told in dramatic form, the story of Philip Nolan takes on a new stature, a greater depth, a stronger meaning. We feel that upon an American holiday such as this, it is highly appropriate to retell this fine American story, and especially in Gene Holloway's exciting radio verse. And now, The Man Without a Country. Order in the court! Order in the court! The attorney for the state will kindly continue. Mr. Nolan, is it not true that you are part of a conspiracy to destroy the government of the United States? No, that is not true. That is not true, I tell you. Do you dare to deny your friendship with Aaron Burr? No, I don't deny that. 
But I do deny all your accusations of treason. Lieutenant Nolan Aaron Burr has shown himself to be an enemy of the United States government. As an American officer, your country's enemies are your enemies. By your association with Aaron Burr, you betray the uniform you wear, the flag you follow, the country you profess to serve. That is true, is it not, Mr. Nolan? No, it is not true. It is not true. You still dare to defend your association with Aaron Burr? I don't think it needs defending. I only talk to the man. You don't think it needs defending. You need say no more, Lieutenant Nolan. I rest my case, Your Honor. <laughs> Philip Nolan, rise and face the court. Philip Nolan, is there anything you wish to say to show that you have always been faithful to the United States? The United States? Damn the United States! I wish I may never hear of the United States again! Who was that man? Who would dare utter such treason? Let me tell you a story, America, about you and your growing. Not a story of a national hero, but of Philip Nolan, who severed a bond before he knew its value. Listen to the story of the man without a country. Think back. Way back to the 1800s. Remember? You were still an adolescent then. You were proud of being a nation of 17 states. And you were beginning to speak grandly of adding Michigan, Indiana, and Mississippi. And becoming 20. Zealous old Tom Jefferson was in the White House, and down in the South was a man named Aaron Burr, and a man named Philip Nolan. They say now, well, now that history has sifted the facts and weighed the evidence, they say Philip Nolan was as fine an officer as any in the Western Division. Oh, he was a little more hot-headed than some, a little swifter to anger than others, a little too quick sometimes about getting his two cents of opinion in, but he was not alone in this. There were many dashing young gallants like him, ready to die for a kiss as a flag. And Philip Nolan might have gone to his final sleep among the vine-covered homes of the dead in Orleans, as quietly as any of them, had a star not crossed his path one night. Mr. Nolan, I'm Aaron Burr. I'm told you're a young man of remarkable promise. I should like to talk to you about your future. Why, thank you, sir. I hardly know what to say. Thank you very much. A star comes that way sometimes. Sudden, blinding, dazzling. Aaron Burr came as a disguised conqueror. Rumor had it that there was an army behind him and an empire before. But that first day in Orleans, though Philip Nolan wasn't to know it for a long time yet, he became the man without a country. It was only a step from Aaron Burr's side to a trial for treason. The United States versus Philip Nolan. He was bewildered, deeply hurt, embittered. Above all else, he was young. An older man would have checked his anger. A traitor would have been wise enough to hide his feelings. But Philip Nolan was neither a wise man nor a traitor. A moment's silence. And then those words that were to echo forever through his life. I wish I may never hear of the United States again! I wish I may never hear of the United States again. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. filled the courtroom, shivered against the walls. No one spoke, no word fell to combat those other words. Half the officers in the room had served through the revolution. They had fought their way, starved and frozen through endless bitter months, so that one day a people could say, this is my country. The judge and the jury rose and left the court wordlessly. No one else stirred. Someone in the back of the room sighed and someone else coughed, that was all. Fifteen minutes went by like fifteen years before the judge returned. Prisoner, hear the sentence of the court. The court decides, subject to the approval of the president, that you shall have your wish. You will never hear the name of the United States again. It was the fall of 1807. It would be 1863 before he heard her name again. The leaves would grow red in Maryland soon. It'd be piled along the Potomac for burning. Their smoke would spiral into lace against the November skies. They'd be tapping the trees for maple sugar in the Vermont woods, and the New England housewives would gather in their spiced kitchens to prepare the Thanksgiving puddings. 
the Cape Cod fishermen would go out in the misty dawn for their nets, and the harvest would be a bright promise on the Indiana hillsides. The Blue Ridge and the Allegheny and the Rockies would pull the snow up over their shoulders and settle down for the winter. And the Mississippi would go slipping on through the heart of America. There would be hearth fires and Christmas trees, and there'd be dances. There would be church service and wedding ceremonial and baptismal. But not for Philip Nolan. His was the sea and the bitterness of salt on his lips and no port at evenings. And in one sudden heart-stabbing moment, Philip Nolan knew what he had lost. Sir, you will receive from Lieutenant Neal the person of Philip Nolan, late a lieutenant in the United States Army. You will take the prisoner on board your ship and keep him there with such precautions as shall prevent his escape. We'll provide him with such quarters, rations, and clothing as would be proper for an officer of his late rank. But under no circumstances is he to ever to hear of his country or see any information regarding it. So Philip Nolan walked the decks of the seven seas and he thought about America. But he never asked about her. He talked to his shipmates about the weather, about the sea, about all things but home. In foreign ports where he was rarely permitted to go ashore, he filled his days with reading. But in the books and the papers given him, there was no mention of America. For him, she was only a dream that had ceased existing. He was a ghost among his companions, drifting from port to port, listening to a word that filled his heart that reached him in the wind, that sighed from the rigging. But the waves whispered through the midnight, one word, America. Grass is blue in Kentucky this spring. Wouldn't you like to ride through it with the earth hard and firm under your horse's feet? Think of it, earth under you. The flower girls are in the streets of Orleans now. It's almost time for the Mardi Gras. Remember the girl you kissed at the Mardi Gras? The fields are white with cotton now. The slaves are singing. What would you give to hear their voices? The snow is thick and white in New England. They are running through it to the Christmas parties. Can't you hear the sleigh bells? How long is it since you heard sleigh bells? Leave me alone. I can't stand thinking anymore. Oh, God, let me stop remembering. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. The court decides subject to the approval of the president that you shall have your way. No! No! Oh! <laughs> The men were kind enough. On Sunday afternoons when they sat on deck, smoking and chatting, they invited Nolan to join them. He had a pleasant voice. Sometimes they asked him to read to them. One day the reading sessions came to an abrupt end. Here, yeah, Nolan, let's have something out of this. The Lay of the Last Minstrel. Walter Scott, eh? Yeah, it's a new book the captain sent down. He says there's some nice stuff in it. Well, let's have a look at it. Breathe there the man with soul so dead... Who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. Uh, whose heart hath ne'er within him burned. His home, his footsteps, he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, uh, someone else finish it. I'm something to attend to. Philip Nolan could never find peace. Ships duck. Set sail, then went home on leave. He watched in wordless agony. He thought of candlelight on warm, gracious tables, of gardens where a man could crumble the rich soil in his fingers, of linens flipping on the clotheslines and the friendly smells of kitchens. He thought of moonlight on hair that was soft as silk to the touch, of eyes liquid in the starlight, of lips velvet smooth and ripe for kissing. He thought of arms opened wide to gather in the returning sailor and one special voice that would say, Welcome home. He thought of perfume and music and the rustle of silk. He was young. And there was a fierce hunger in him. Then one night in the Mediterranean, some ladies were invited aboard for a ship's ball. All that was young in Philip Nolan died that night. As he stood on deck, looking at the girl he had loved, a lifetime ago. Anne. Anne Emery. Why, Philip Nolan. This 
is a surprise. You're looking splendid, Philip. The sea evidently agrees with you. I'd forgotten how lovely you are. You must have forgotten many things. It's almost impossible to believe finding your way out here. I'm on my way home. I've been visiting in France. I tried to see you before I left. They wouldn't let me see anyone. I understand. I was very busy at the time, anyhow. I was married soon after you left. Married? Yes, of course. Hadn't you heard? I have a little boy now. A little boy? You must be very happy. I am, Philip. It's so strange that we should meet again way out here. I'm a little sorry we did meet. I'd forgotten you. It was better that way. I loved you very much. I loved you and I lost you. And everything else I loved in one mad moment. Oh, my dear. I think we should get back to the dancers. Yeah, of course. And would you tell me just one thing? What do you uh, hear from home? Home, Mr. Nolan? I thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again. I beg your pardon. Am I in? Philip Nolan knew in that moment how alone he was. One man with only the sea for the rest of his life and one nameless port at the end of it. The days became weeks and the weeks years that marched across his forehead and left him old. His eyes were deep pools of loneliness, his heart completely empty. No one knew until the day he was dying how deep his hurt had gone. No one knew until that day when they entered his room for the first time and found it a shrine to America. Stars and stripes were draped around a picture of Washington, and he had painted a majestic eagle with its foot clasping the whole globe. At the foot of his bed was a great map of the United States, drawn from memory. Here, Captain, you see, I I have a country. Yes, I see, Nolan. How do you feel? Is there anything I can do for you? Captain, I'm dying. I'll never see my country again. But there's not a man on this ship or in all the United States that loves you as I do. Would you... Would you tell me about America? Tell you about America? How can I begin to tell you about America? He had left America in 1807. It was 1863. War had come and gone in 1812, and Francis Scott Key had sat on a British battleship and written the national anthem. Jackson had taken the Florida Territory. A new flag had been raised in Washington with 13 alternate stripes and 20 stars. Nine presidents had been in the White House. The Monroe Doctrine had been born, the cornerstone of American foreign policy. The continents of the Western Hemisphere are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any of the European powers. The United States had begun to gather themselves into a nation. It is not the states, but the people of the nation who have made the union. It is, sir, the people's constitution, the people's government, made for the people, answerable to the people. Tell him about America. Tell him about Peter Cooper's steam locomotive, the Tom Thumb drawing its first train of cars over 23 miles of the B&O Railroad. Tell them about America. Andrew Jackson had moved the Indians west of the Mississippi. Arkansas, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa had joined the nation. The Battle of the Alamo had been fought in Texas and gold discovered in California. The new nation had spanned two oceans, and in the White House was the president whose words were the voice of the new nation. That we here highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Tell him about America, the power, the color, the strength, the beauty, the tears, the triumphs. Tell him so that he knows the glory he thrust aside. She's a great nation, Captain. A great nation. Yes, Nolan, a great nation. Nolan. Nolan. And 
so his last thought was of his country. Before they lowered him into the sea, they draped the flag of the United States over his coffin. How proud that would have made him. The captain intoned the last rites. The bugler played tap. And the ceremony was over. Men, we found this paper in Nolan's things. Bury me in the sea. It has been my home, and I love it. But will someone not set up a stone for my memory at Fort Adams or at Orleans, so that my disgrace will not follow me through eternity? Say on it, in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the army of the United States. He loved his country as no other man has ever loved her. But no man deserved less at her hands. We will do as he wished. And so, although the sea claimed him, his soul would know the feeling of land again. The flowers would be near him and the trees and the earth of America. He would know the seasons and the pulsing life of the nation. There would be a flag over him and the knowledge of belonging. And thus, the man without a country came home to America. The Man Without a Country a poetic narrative by Gene Holloway, based on Edward Everett Hale's immortal story, and narrated by Bing Crosby with Frank Lovejoy as Philip Nolan. On Anthology, Memorial Day, 1954. <laughs> And so, Anthology number 13, transcribed and dated Sunday, May 30th. Next week, our guest will be Marion Rooney of Cademan Records, who will tell us the story behind their famous recordings of contemporary American poets and readers such as Herd Hatfield, Joe Van Fleet, and Frank Silvera. With her, Miss Rooney will bring the newest Cademan recording of Judith Anderson, reading the poetry of Edna St. Vincent Millay. Anthology comes to you with the cooperation of the YW and YMHA Poetry Center, 92nd Street and Lexington Avenue, John Milcom Brennan, Director. The program is produced by Steve White, written and directed by Draper Lewis. And now this is Fleetwood wishing you good luck and good reading. Don't forget to join us next Sunday at 3 for another edition of Anthology on your community stations in New York.